Hey, just a couple announcements before we get started with the message and, and looking in God's Word. We have the, uh, the food distribution tomorrow, and we have quite a few people that normally help with that in Florida. And so if you can help with that, it starts at 2 o'clock at the Journey Center, M15, right by the railroad tracks. We're going to give away about 15,000 pounds of food tomorrow to our community. And so if you can help with that, we would love to have you. 2 o'clock, we need some people to help in the parking lot, and we need some help people to help with um, packaging up the food and getting it ready to go. And so it's usually running around. 2 o'clock till 5 o'clock-ish. And so if you can help with that, that would be amazing. Today, right after church service today, 11.30-ish or so, depending on how long I speak, we have Journey 101. If you are coming to Journey 101, I'm so glad you are. We have over 20 people coming to Journey 101 to understand what it means to be a member here at Journey Ministries. And so we're going to have lunch in included. And uh, Miss Holly Hollebecki is speaking today, uh, teaching that class today. And so it's going to be a, uh, a good thing for us there. High school youth group, you're at 3 o'clock today. It's because of Super Bowl, the football game that's going on. You're at 3 o'clock today at the Journey Center. So if you're in high school, 9th through 12th grade, come and join uh, Pastor Nick there for the, uh, the high school youth group. Yeah, last week we started a, a new series. It's called Who's Your One? And the idea behind this is that we must do whatever it takes to reach the lost, and it starts with one. If you're new here today, I am so glad that you are here joining us today. Hopefully somebody, whether it was a family member, a community member, somebody that you know invited you in today's service to, uh, to join us today. And so if you're new here, thank you for being here. I'm so glad that you are. If you missed last week, can I encourage you, go back and watch on the Journey Ministries YouTube channel. Watch last week's service, what we're talking about and why we're doing what we're doing for Who's Your One. This is going to lead us into the Easter season. What in the world? Resurrection Sunday is almost here already. And so we've got today plus two more weeks of this Who's Your One. And then we're going to go into our Easter series. And I'm really excited about the Easter series starting in uh, March, the first Sunday of March. It's going to be a, a good one. So I will invite you back to that. So here we are. We must do whatever it takes to reach the loss. And it starts with one. It starts with you inviting one of the persons. Uh, uh, last week, there's some of these cards floating around. Last week, I challenged you to take and write some names on a card. And on that, I would want you, what I wanted you to do is pray for each of those names by name and, in, and have the courage, the boldness to invite them back to today or Better yet, invite them into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So if you didn't get a card last week, there's some more on the offering table over there. And you can write down the names and, and just start praying about the names of people that don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior or haven't attended church with you for a long time. And, and just start inviting them and, and encouraging them to come back and to understand who Jesus is a little bit better. So we're going to be looking at this. Our, our main verse for the next couple weeks is this. John chapter 14, verse 6. It says this. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is our, our main verse. Again, I'm going to just ask you again this week. I asked this last week. By the raise of a hand, who believes that this is true? I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Yeah. If, if you're joining us online today, if you would just put in the comments there, yup, if you believe that, that would be helpful for us to understand. The reason I'm doing that is this. There may be people in this room or watching online that have no idea who Jesus Christ is as their personal Savior. And I want people to understand and to see that there's people in this room who have some of the answers or will find the answers for you. And so if you raised your hand, be ready for people to ask you those questions. Who is Jesus? What is Jesus all about? I want people in this room to not feel like they're, they're left outside, but I want to challenge you if you're in this room and you don't know who Jesus Christ is as your personal Savior, I want to challenge you to keep asking questions and to keep living in those doubts and to, and to, to live in those questions. To, to figure out who this Jesus person is that we're talking about on Sunday morning. I would encourage you, to, if you don't have a Bible, to get a Bible. There's some here. Otherwise, I'll buy one for you, or Journey Ministries has some there. We'll get one for you. And I would encourage you to start in the book of John. And, and so start reading through that as a new believer, as a, a person that doesn't understand who Jesus Christ is. Here's what we're doing. We're looking at this verse, John chapter 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but through him. And we're saying this is the good news. This is how Jesus is providing a way for us to live in fellowship, communion with God. And so last week I, I showed you some numbers just in our own personal town, 15-minute drive from the Journey Center, which is the, right again, M15, right by the railroad tracks. A 15-minute drive from the Journey Center, there's 117,000 people living in this area. We must do whatever it takes to reach the lost. 
117,000 people right here in Davison community, 15 minutes from the Journey Center. Look at these numbers from Revitalized Network and from Resi.com. Attending religious services out of those 117,000 people, there's 33% that rarely attend a religious service. For us as Journey Ministries, for us as Christ followers, that's the number that we're trying to go after. I don't want people coming into this room, and, and maybe I should re- reword that. I want people coming into this room from other churches, but if they're involved in other churches and they're serving in other churches, I don't want them here. That's not the, that's not the goal of Journey Ministries. That's not who we're trying to reach. Our goal, my goal, is that we would go across the street or we would be standing in the Walmart line or we would be standing at work and we would be saying, if you're not a Christ follower, come in and be invited into Journey Ministries. We want the messy, we want the dirty because that's who I am, right? That's what I've started with. And I've seen a life change inside of myself and I know that can happen for you and I know that can happen for your friends that don't understand or know Jesus Christ. So here's the thing. We're not just trying to give them hell insurance, right? We're not just trying to say, okay, you're a Christ follower, a Christian, yay God. We're trying to say we want you to be a full disciple of Jesus Christ. We want to baptize you and we want you to be taught on what it means to be a Jesus follower. That's our goal at Journey Ministries, and so that's why we're doing this series. Here's the three goals that I actually wrote down for this. Number one, I want us as Journey Ministries, Christ followers here at Journey Ministries, to get serious about reaching those who are far from God. Number two, I want us to get serious about prayer and the power of prayer. That's why I asked you to write down names and to be praying for those names on that list. And number three, I want us to get serious about individual gospel conversations. That's what we're starting today. I'm going to give you very easy-to-use tools to be able to go out and use, uh, speak the gospel to the people around you. Just like what's happening there in Kentucky and how that revival's taking place, my prayer is that those students will leave that room and they'll have the courage to go out into all of the world and preach the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. That's the same prayer that I have for us. That after today we will leave this room and we will have the courage to go out into all of the world and preach the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to get serious about these gospel conversations and I'm going to give you the tools to be able to use that. And so today we're going to look at this, God's design. If you have this paper, there should be some around the room with you, some pens, some pa- uh, pencils, that type of thing. Grab this piece of paper. I purposely made the, the font up at the top lighter so that you can trace it as we're going along. I want you to get this embedded in your mind of what's going on. If you don't have one of these papers, there's some more around you, normally up in the front seat. So if you need to come and grab one, go ahead, do that, grab a pen, grab a a pencil, and uh, we're going to start talking about this. We're going to start talking about God's design. So take a pencil or a pen, circle that, and write out God's design right there in that first circle. We're going to see what this is all about. You see, I believe that we've been designed on purpose, that God designed you and me on purpose. A creative God creatively created us. We have been designed on purpose for a purpose. And as humans, when we've been designed like this, we were actually the center of God's plan for the entire cosmos, like the entire world, the entire universe, everything, that we were part of this purpose. We were here and we were designed by God. And he has actually set this eternity life, eternal life inside of us as humans. He said that he wants to, he, he, give, he gave us this desire to have this relationship with, with him. He, he helped us understand what that looks like inside of the garden. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and we're going to see this entire part of God's design. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You see, in this moment, as God was there, he placed order into the entire cosmos. He had placed order into the entire land and into the sky and into the seas. And as we look in this passage at context, we know that the biblical Hebrew writers, they use certain words that we're not familiar with today. One of them is that the heavens, go to the next slide, heavens right there. The heavens were actually the skies above. It wasn't like the heaven that we picture as of of humans saying, okay, God's up in heaven. That's where his throne is. That's not what this... Hebrew writers talking about. He's saying the skies above, in the heavens, the skies above, and that earth, that's literally land. Not earth as we know it, but it's just the land. And so we see here that the sky above and the land. In the beginning, God created the sky above, and he created the land. In these two verses, the Hebrew writer begins to explain just a little bit more about this chaos that was taking place, this darkness that was taking place. Let's look. Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. The earth was formless. The land was formless and empty and darkness covered the deep waters and the spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. The earth, that land, it had no purpose. It had no order. Let's look at the next slide. It had no purpose. It had no order. This land that was being formed here, 
No purpose, no order, chaos. So this earth, this land, it was formless. It had no purpose. It had no order. As we look, darkness covered. That darkness that covered the deep. This is a deep abyss. The Hebrew writers, they were talking about this deep abyss or this dark, chaotic ocean. In fact, the ancients, they would describe this as the non-reality before creation. This, this darkness, this, this emptiness, this void, this chaotic moment, this, this moment before creation is what these words meant as the ancients, the Hebrews, described this verse. And then there was the Spirit of God that was hovering over the waters. This is an invisible presence. We've talked about this word before. It's the rukah. This, this meaning of rukah, this Hebrew word for Spirit of God, it means the wind or the breath. In this moment, it's meaning God's invisible presence. And so here's what we have. We, we have God in this presence, this invisible presence. We can't see him. We don't understand him. But he's there and he's inside of this deep abyss, this darkness. And rukah is starting to bring order into this land. Ruka is starting to bring things that are coming into this land. Life is going to flourish. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. And then as we continue to read through Genesis chapter 1, the very first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, we start seeing that six days appear. And there's this ordering that begins by the Spirit of God, Ruka. And this ordering begins, and it's part of God's design for all of humanity, but the cosmos, everything. And so we see days one, two, and three, we see that God brings order to this darkness. And then days four, five, and six, we see that God fills this darkness, he fills this land, and it's used for flourishing, it's used for life. And then at the end of the day, uh, all six days, we see, or at the beginning, I'm sorry, at the beginning of all six days, we see that God said, and it happened. And then at the end of the six days, we hear the phrase, and there was morning and there was evening. So let's look at this. Day one. Can you actually go back all the way to the slide so that it starts with day one instead of having it all up there yet? Please, thank you. And so here's what we have. We have in our Bibles, Genesis chapter 1, and we're looking in this darkness into order. And in day 1, we have the order of time. God said, let there be light, and there was light, and this glorious light filled, and it contained the darkness, and it separated the days from the night. This was creating time. Remember where that is, day 1, compared to where day 4 is. In day 2, we saw the order of the sky and the sea. And in this, we saw that God split the chaos of the waters. He split the waters above and the waters below. He, he made it so there was this atmosphere. And the waters were separated inside of this. Remember day two compared to day five. Day three, we have the order of the land. And in this order of the land, God started to establish the land. He started to establish the sea. He started to establish the vegetation and the, the plants and the, and the trees and the flowers. He, he started creating the vegetables and the seeds for these to continue to produce. And so in days one, two, and three, we saw this order come into darkness. We saw that the, 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 God established the order from the darkness. We see that he created order in the cosmos. And then he begins to fill the land on day four. And on day four, we have the sun, the moon, and the stars. And what is this happening? This is creating order in time. It's creating our calendars. It's creating the separation of day and night. It's creating our clocks. It's creating the, the seasons that we have. And so in the order of time, we have the sun, moon, and stars. Wow. Day five, in the order of the sea, the sky and the sea, he begins to, to speak into the name and ex existence, the fish and the birds. And in the order of the sky, he says, let the water swarm with fish and other life and let the skies be filled with birds of every kind. And he blessed them and he said, let, these be, let them be fruitful and let them multiply. And so in the sky and in the sea, we see that God has given us life. And it's life that's flourishing. It's good. And it continues. In day six, we see that in the order of land, God gave us the animals and humans. God filled the land with all sorts of wild animals, with beasts, with livestock, with small animals. He filled the land with producing offspring. And they were starting to make their own kind. And when God saw this, he looked down and he said, wow, this is good. 
And in the order of the land, we see that the animals and the humans were created. And when humans were created, he said, let human beings be created in our image. Wow. Are you picturing this as as the darkness and the order in the darkness, as we see these days become, become filled and he begins to fill the land and he begins to create seasons and create birds and fish and animals. And then all of a sudden he stops and he creates humans. And he says, it's very good. And he says, it's very good. And we were created in his image. This was God's design. This is why God did exactly what he did. And then on day seven, what did God do? He rested. On day seven, all of his work was completed. There was order out of darkness. And God rested. After God filled the land and the skies, he rested. And after he saw that everything was made and was made very good, he rested and he dwelled in this sacred space. This entire cosmos is his holy temple and this world where the humans are is where God is living with these humans. He's having relationship with them. He's having conversations with them. And he's telling these these people, these humans, you're now going to be ruling over the world. You're going to rule and reign over the fish and the birds and the livestock. You're going to reign over the things that scurry along the ground. And here, look at I'm going to produce plants and fruits and veggies for your enjoyment, for you. This is my design. Here it is. And God saw that it was very good. And this is God's design for what's taking place in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning is to show us, it's to reveal us God's creation. It's to reveal God's design. And so now I'm just going to take us back a little bit through this chapter. And I want us to just dive in a little bit deeper on this. I want us to just slow down, break it down a little bit, and see what God's design is. So God's design number one. God created us, and he loves us. God created us, and he loves us. God created me on purpose. He created you on purpose. He created us as a creative being. He designed you with a purpose. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, again in that first chapter of Genesis, the very beginning, verse 26, we see this. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth and the small animals that scurry along the ground. You and I are the pinnacle of God's creation. We are made in his image. We were created by God. And it was very good. God's design number two is this. God has a design for every aspect of our lives. You see, I believe that when we were designed in his identity, when we were designed in his image, and he called us very good, he designed us in every single aspect of our life. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. Let's look at this. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. He designed us in our identity of who God is. He designed us as male and as females. And what he told us in this is he said, you are to be fruitful and you are to multiply. He designed us to have purpose. And in that, he designed our families. Look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the air. God designed our families. He designed our relationships. He designed our identity and he designed our families. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to be fruitful. I want you to multiply. I want you to fill the earth. Husbands, I want you to to love your wife. Wife, I want you to respect your husband. And then I want you to understand what it means to grow up your children in the way that they should go. God designed our work life. In Genesis, again, Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, as we continue that verse, he says, and subdue it and have dominion over the fish in the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God designed us to work. To work in the garden, to take care of the land, to rule over the animals. God designed us on purpose. 
He designed our identity. He designed our family, and He designed us what it means for us to work. And then He says, I've designed rest. Yes, I want you to work hard, but now I want you to rest and to rest well. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished His work that He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work that He had done. So God blessed the seventh day, and He made it holy. Because on it, God rested from all of His work that He had done in creation. You see, in this our example, God rested. This is a hard one for me. I don't rest well unless it's Sunday afternoon and I can take naps. Other than that, I don't rest well. But God designed us to rest. Well, I, I think the reason He designed us to, wet, to rest is because of those six days of creation where he said that you are to reign and to rule. He's put this job into us, and this resting day helps us to remember who God is and to rest with him. It, it helps us to remember that we're supposed to be bringing glory to God. It was good. To, to say that all that God has done, all that God is doing, all that God will do is very good. That's why we rest on the seventh day, so we can give honor and respect and rest with God to enjoy his company, to, to live in that relationship that God designed. We continue in Genesis chapter 2, and we see that God designed our marriages. Chapter 2, verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. God's design for us is to grow up and to have a spouse or a helpmate, and to do, to do the things that God designed us to do. He, he's designed us to be in relationship. Relationship with our spouse or our helpmate, but also relationship with Him. And we see this design over and over and over again in the very first book of Genesis, the beginning. God's design number three. God has a design for relationship with Him. Not just with our spouse or our helpmate, not just with our, our friendship groups or our families, but God seriously wants to have a relationship with us. And, and God designed us to have this unbroken relationship. That's why he was allowed, or we were allowed to walk with him in the garden. That's why we were allowed to have relationship with him, why we were able to have communion with him, to, to hear his voice, to be able to walk with him and talk with him in that broke, unbroken relationship in the garden. God designed order. And in that order, he gave us life to flourish. In John 10.10, 10, uh, the, the thief comes to destroy, but I have come to give you abundant life. God's design is for us as Christ's followers to have abundant life. And then we see in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, we see this relationship with God. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. God was walking with them. He was, he was talking with them. He was looking for them. He had relationship with his people. And unfortunately, because of our sin, because brokenness happened, because of disobedience, because of rebellion, us turning our, turning our back on God, the man and the wife, they hid themselves separation happened. God's design that, that he designed that was good, that was very good, it was destroyed, that communion was broken. And on your piece of paper there, you can see that there's a spot there where it has an arrow with sin. If you would just fill that in. And then as you move over into the brokenness, if you would write that word out and highlight that, Put those arrows on there. We feel that God's design is broken. We see that we know that God's design is broken because of that sin. Brokenness took place. Separation took place. We were no longer allowed to be a part of God's design because of that sin. And my friends, it feels kind of weird to stop here, but we're going to. And here's the reason why. The reason why is because next week we're going to look at this thing called brokenness. We're, we're going to look at this thing called sin, the, the thing that separated us from our personal Savior. 
The, the thing that separated us out of God's design. We're going we're gonna to pause right here. We're going to stop right here. But listen to me closely. If you're online, listen to me closely. If you're sitting in this room and you don't know who Jesus Christ is as your Lord and personal Savior, over on the, uh, the offering table over there is a book like this. It says Life, Three Circles, Life's Conversation Guide. If you're not a Christ follower, this reveals the rest of the story. This reveals the three circles that are on your piece of paper. I want you to understand, I want you to see, I want you to know that the story doesn't stop today. God's story, Jesus' story, continues through that brokenness into the gospel of Jesus Christ dying on that cross for you and for me, being an atonement for our sins. It continues into the gospel, and through that gospel, we can be restored back to God's original design, a relationship with Him. If you're online and you want one of these, I'll post it online or I can um, mail it to you. If you're sitting in this room, they're right over there on the offering table. And then what I want you to do is this. I want you to have a conversation with me. Will you text me, email me? My information's all over the place in the, in the program that you should have been handed. It's in there. I want to have that conversation with you if you are not a Christ follower. I want you to understand that there is hope after today. There is hope through that brokenness. So next week, we're going to continue in brokenness. And as Christ followers, us that are trying to help others become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ, we're going to continue on and seeing what this brokenness is about. If you're a Christ follower, this is a great opportunity to invite your friends back next week who don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the brokenness and the sin. And I'm going to show you some of the ideas behind of why I believe things in this world today are happening because of that sin and that brokenness and the need for a personal Savior. Let's pray. God, thank you for the good news, the gospel. Thank you that we can be restored, reconciled, recovered back to you. And Father, if we repent and we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, your word tells us that we will be saved. And so, Father, for the Christ followers sitting in this room or watching online, I ask that they will have a boldness to be able to become more like you, they will have a boldness to go out into all of the world and to invite that one person that needs to hear that they have a Savior. Father, if there's people sitting in this room or watching online, Holy Spirit, I would ask that you would soften their hearts and their minds and help them to see that you are God. And anything that they try to do isn't good enough. For the wages of sin is death. We deserve it. But the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus. That's the gospel, the good news. The bad news, we're separated from you. The good news, you've provided a way for us to be restored back to you into the perfect design that you've given us. And so, Holy Spirit, this week, as we go about our business, as we go to school, as we go to work, as we walk through Walmart, Meyer, as we sit in the pickup line to pick up our children, as we attend the sporting events, wherever we go, Father, wherever we go, Help us to understand and to know that there is someone around us that doesn't know you. Work through our actions and our good deeds. Work through our conversations. Work through opening our mouth when it's time to open and keeping quiet when it's time to keep quiet. Help us as Christ's followers to study your word to apply it to our lives, to have a desire to want to spend time with you because we know that there's power in prayer, conversation with you. God, thank you. Thank you for your perfect design. Thank you for wanting to have a relationship with us. Help us to see that, to know that, to understand that. And to live that out loud for the world to see. 
I love you, Jesus. I know there's many in this room and many watching online that say the same. They love you. And we've realized that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father but through you. Help the world to see. Let revival take place as individuals and as the body of Christ, not just here at this church, but all of the churches all over the world. You are good. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Will you stand with us and sing, please? Let's close with this. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. Then God looked over all he had made, and he saw that it was very good. You have been created on purpose. You are very good. Sin came into the world, which created us to be bad. But in God's perfect design, you are very good. And so my goal is that we'll start learning to live in the very good. And that we'll invite our friends to understand what it means to live in the very good. And so here's my encouragement. Go out. Invite your friend. Invite your one to come back and to hear their need of a Savior. Wow. Wow. If you're part of Journey 101 today, uh, membership class, it's happening at 1130. I ended on time. Enough time for you to get there. So well done. Uh, that's at 1130. If you'll help us clean up the rooms, clean up the, uh, the, the chairs, and then enjoy the week. Bye-bye.